Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Joe, and today I'm joined by my guest, Marsha Moran. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Joe. I am glad to be here. Um, we're glad to have you. Um, so, Marsha, you have a pretty interesting story that uh, you're planning to share with us today. Um, I guess, where, where do we even begin with this story? I don't, I don't want to give anything away, so... Well, I usually start at the beginning, which was, for me, it was a Sunday. And I woke up and I felt off and I didn't know why. So I texted my friend Rochelle to tell her that I wouldn't make breakfast and I couldn't read the text. So I put my phone down and I rolled over and I had the most incredible headache hit. And despite the pain, I fell asleep. And when I woke up the next time, I knew I was in real trouble because my right side was paralyzed. <laughs> so I fell out of bed and I dragged myself across the carpet using my left hand as leverage. And I knew I had to reach up and grab the, the door handle because the door was closed. And I don't know how long it took me, but I finally stuck it open and I was tired and sweaty. So I took a break and I don't know how long that break was, but I finally started down the hall and I ran totally out of gas. And I knew that my husband was downstairs because I could hear the TV and something went crash. And he came upstairs and he said, Marsha, are you okay? Can you talk to me? And that's when I realized I couldn't talk. So he called 911, the paramedics arrived. And that was the first time either one of us heard the word stroke. One, one of them said, when did she have a stroke? It's like, oh, okay, this is not very good. <laughs> so that's kind of how my morning started. And do you know how long of a process that actually took from the time you had the headache to the time? No idea. So I was actually in the middle of a stroke when I woke up because I couldn't read the text. And that's one reason or one sign of aphasia. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that. Yeah. So I had no idea. Okay. And you said... Um, the symptoms that you experienced during the stroke were a severe headache. And then once you woke up, you realized you couldn't read. And then when your husband came up, you realized you couldn't speak. And obviously you were having difficulty walking and that paralysis of the right side. What, what else was going through your brain at this time? Um, Cause I don't know if you've read uh, my stroke of insight or by Jill Bolton Taylor uh, and her, the way she describes what's happening is very interesting. I don't know if you had a similar uh, situation. So actually her book is the first one I read after I got released from the hospital. And I had to read it and reread it and reread it because I, I couldn't remember anything for months after the stroke. Mm -hmm. So I think the most critical short term was the short the paralysis mm -hmm. and it came back so I had some movement but I actually worked for a year and a half to be able to move so now when somebody looks at me they can't say that I've had a stroke mm -hmm. because everything's lined up but it took a long long time I had five physical therapists and the last one worked for me for a year. Mm -hmm. So, um, but funny enough, it was actually my speech that was the most devastating because I couldn't speak well for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And um, in your, your book, uh, you mention how crucial it was to have your husband uh, kind of be your voice during that time. Uh, can you talk us through that 
part of the story? Yeah, so when he showed up to my hospital room, he didn't show me that he was scared. <laughs> and I actually didn't know how bad it was for him until after I got home. But he was so wonderful. He was encouraging. He tried to understand what I wanted when the doctors communicated to me and I couldn't speak back. So he would try to figure out what I wanted to say and he communicated for me pretty well. And without his constant care, I would have been a completely different person now than I was because he actually made sure that I took care of myself. And in that, he actually took care of himself too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a joint effort. And obviously, I mean, maybe not obviously, but he's your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have uh, built trust that you've accumulated over the years. Right. What is that like to just really kind of forfeit or to, to just completely let go and let someone else uh, dictate your life for you during that vulnerable period of time? So I couldn't actually remember much. Mm -hmm. So people would come in, they'd talk, I understood what they said. And when they left the room, I completely forgot what they'd said. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was comforting because I knew that there was somebody there who would actually remember things and would tell me again and again and again so that I would remember, although I didn't. So that was important to me. And I think it's really important to everyone to figure out who will care for them if they're is an accident or a disease that they have to work themselves through mm -hmm. because going alone is really not a good option yeah yeah you're so fortunate to have him in your corner during that time and we've talked about it on this podcast before that a lot of these injuries you know can be very debilitating obviously mm -hmm. a lot of them uh are very hard to understand mm -hmm. um, and they can be very sudden. So having that proper support team, that support system in place is crucial. Mm. So, so you're very fortunate to have him uh, in your yeah. life beside you, yeah. yeah. Um, you had mentioned, so, so how long was it that you uh, needed to rely on him uh, to speak for you? So he spoke for me probably, I'm going to say it's kind of segmented here. So he spoke for me until August. And at that time, he went back to work. And I learned to drive again. And I learned to drive because he said, that was kind of the test for me. If I couldn't drive, he couldn't turn over the keys, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I learned to drive again. And at that point, I started taking some of the responsibility that had been going on from him to me. But I still had aphasia and aphasia is a communication disorder. And if you're not cured within the first three months, they say that you will probably have it for life. And I didn't want to have, to have it. So despite that, I kept looking for a cure. And I think I found one. I had neurofeedback from a chiropractor. So at three and a half years, I could speak at a conversational level, but I couldn't speak lower. So like it, if you are working, you have to speak at a professional level. I just couldn't get there. So I, I just, I, I actually couldn't communicate with my husband very easily either. If I were a little bit upset, those words just couldn't come to me and I couldn't say them. Um, 
you mentioned that you had seen multiple practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you sound like you're very determined uh, <laughs> after this happened. So what are some, what was your journey like with, uh, with the recovery process and those practitioners? So I actually had an appointment with, with Dr. Para and he was going to discuss a low level laser light therapy to me. Mm -hmm. And I told him it had been almost two years since I'd had my stroke. And he said he didn't know if it would work, but he could try. Mm -hmm. And I had my first session with him. And right after the first session, I decided to go running. And when I was running, I fell down. I dislocated my elbow. And I asked my husband to take me to the hospital because I needed them to reset it for me. Here's the interesting thing. When they were resetting my elbow, they gave me morphine. Mm. And when the morphine was in me, there was no aphasia. Interesting. So I knew something would work. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I worked on the laser therapy for several months. Mm -hmm. And it got me somewhat better. So once again, I could talk well at the conversational level, but I couldn't talk at the deeper level. And I communicated my dissatisfaction and Dr. Para made an adjustment to the treatment. And I still felt stuck. So I began looking at other things and I found neurofeedback, mm -hmm. which was offered by a different chiropractor. And I was interested because he gave me the URL and he said, I needed to go research this topic. And I looked at it and it said 85% of traumatic brain injury survivors who had neurofeedback got better. Oh, well, that's encouraging. <laughs> So I said, and, and there was no way that it would make me worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I thought, I have to try this. Yeah. I went in for my first treatment and I left spe speaking somewhat better that day. After 16 treatments, I spoke like I do today. Wow. So before Dr. Fuller and the neurofeedback, it was like there were two people talking in my head. So I knew exactly what I wanted to say and I couldn't say it. So I said something different that was kind of close enough. Now I have one person in my head. And so what I think is what I say. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's phenomenal. Neurofeedback is fantastic. Yeah. Um, we use it in this clinic as well and just love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your patients must be very happy because I, there's, I, I can't express how grateful I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, was that the last practitioner you saw then? Um, or how, how's your journey been since then? So I see Dr. Para still because there's 25% chance of Alzheimer's since I have a brain injury. Mm -hmm. So I see him on a regular basis because I want to be treated for that. If, you know, if there's any way around it, I'm going to, I'm going to find it. Yeah. Um, I don't see Dr. Fuller because of COVID, mm -hmm. but once COVID is over, I am going to go back because he treats me for, um, Shoot. I don't remember the name of it, but okay. um, <laughs> he's, he's treating you for something. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he's a nutritionist, he's a chiropractor. I mean, he does so many different things mm -hmm. that um, you don't know what he's going to give you when you go. Um, but he, when he learns of a treatment, he 
goes to see what it's like. He gets the treatment. If he likes the treatment, he brings it into his office. Mm -hmm. And because he actually looks at not only what the treatment does, but he actually listens and feels it himself, that's what I think makes him special to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've mentioned a couple chiropractors at this point in time. Uh, and you were making the joke earlier before we started the, the podcast that a lot of uh, uh, doctors told you to steer clear of them yep. after afterwards. Uh, are, are you glad you didn't listen? <laughs> uh, actually, I am. So I have been seeing a chiropractor since I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And I actually found a different set of chiropractors after my stroke because I was afraid of the neurologist and what he said. Mm -hmm. So I found a chiropractor that treated me with um, small movements. So I don't have my back cracking anymore, but it sounds like he's kind of like a, he's moving my back, but he's very, gentle about it mm -hmm. and so I think the world of him mm -hmm. yeah and I think most people kind of put chiropractors in a box and they assume that uh, they all do kind of the same thing maybe is you know snapping yeah. your back and your neck and things like that whereas yeah. you've been to kind of a multitude of different practitioners and even though they kind of had the same doctorate they all practice in slightly different ways yeah. so if you if you're not particularly a fan of one style there's 372 other styles that yeah. you can probably find um so yeah i'm very happy that you were able to find uh success with so many different yeah. uh, practitioners yeah um what what was your life like prior to the stroke and what would you say is the biggest change that it's had uh moving forward in today well i was a marketer before the stroke i had my own business mm -hmm. and so when i had my stroke the business just kind of went away and coming back from the stroke i thought i could work for somebody else unfortunately I couldn't speak to them. <laughs> so I wound up writing the book. And instead of going back to a, I decided I would reach out and actually try to become an advocate for stroke patients in general. So the COVID-19 situation has made it a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. But um, I go on podcasts, I'm doing some speeches from my home office, mm -hmm. and I think that I'm getting some traction. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. great. What would you say, I mean, this is obviously a very life-changing event. Yeah. Um, what would you say your biggest takeaway or life lesson that has really sunk with you? Uh, since it's happened? Well, there are a lot of them. I think the most important thing is that you need to focus on your family and friends and the people around you, even though you don't know them. Um, and you have to think about when they maybe have a problem and are they're acting out, you have to be compassionate mm -hmm. because you don't know what they're going through. I think also for stroke survivors never give up <laughs> ever 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 because you don't know what you find right mm -hmm. for caretakers they need to take some time for themselves mm -hmm. and i guess that's my biggest piece is just breathe and try to stay in the moment <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, good advice for everyone, really. Yeah. Um, looking back on it, I know hindsight is twenty twenty, but uh, looking back on your journey, if you could kind of go back in time, or if you knew someone else who started or just had a stroke, 
how would you lay out the roadmap for them to get to where you are? You know, what are the most pivotal steps they should take? So I think that every stroke is different. Mm -hmm. So each path is going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But people ask all the time on Facebook, is it normal to sleep as much? Mm -hmm. Yes, sleep as much as you can because your brain has to recover. Mm -hmm. And sleeping as much as you can can go on for many, many years. And that's got to be okay with you. Um, people have got to realize that what you're doing every day that you're doing something, whether you get up for a few minutes and that's all you're capable of doing, that's okay. Mm -hmm. If you get up and take a shower and go back to bed, that's okay. What matters is that you don't give up what, whatever you're doing. So maybe it's something big like, oh, I walk the first time without a cane. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. You have to cherish it. Um, sometimes it's maybe, hey, wait, I snapped my fingers for the first time. That's a little thing to most people, but for you, maybe it's a big thing. Celebrate. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, from working with other stroke patients, it, it kind of gives you a deeper appreciation for, like you said, these little things like snapping your fingers, like so many mm -hmm. things that we take for granted, all these complex mm -hmm. things that our brain uh, allows us to do. And, you know, brain injuries just rob us of these things that we really don't think about. Um, yeah. So just rebuilding those little things step by step and you know, staying in the moment and appreciating what you're you're allowed to what you're able to do uh yeah. yeah so it took so long for me to actually learn how to walk again mm -hmm. and you just have to take every single step and if you have just the slightest improvement be grateful mm -hmm. yeah because every little bit counts it really does Mm -hmm. um so i want to make sure we touch on uh your book that you you uh sent me so uh you documented your uh kind of your journey in this book which is a great great kind of memoir for maybe other people who know someone or are currently you know dealing with the after effects of a stroke um, yeah. Can you talk about how people or what people can expect from the book and uh, where they might find it? So I wrote the book from my perspective, but it also has my husband's perspective and mm -hmm. some friends, my sister and my doctors, because we all view stroke survivors a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So people can see what it is we went through. I also have a few step, steps in there from, I could have quotes in there from people I thought might, people might find them interesting. Mm -hmm. So for example, 65% of people have trouble swallowing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I thought that was a great quote. I think that most of all though, people will understand what it takes to get through a stroke. So I took three and a half years before I finally found a solution to my aphasia. Mm -hmm. It may take longer for you to find something for whatever it is that's got you down, but you can just keep on going because the first time you give up, that's okay if you miss one day, but if you miss two, that's the wrong, wrong way to go. Yeah. Um, Marsha, we are just about out of time and I want to make sure that we save some time at the end for you to give us any final thoughts or parting words, uh, maybe some words of hope for other survivors out there uh, that you might have. Well, I think that 
you have to try every day like i said you have to be grateful for the little things mm -hmm. and most of all you have to try to be happy mm -hmm. because if you're not happy you're definitely going in the wrong way yeah yeah I think key things for yeah. you know anyone struggling with uh brain injury or illness in general so yeah well, thank you again for being on the show today, Marsha. Uh, your book is called Stroke Forward. Um, and where can they get that again? They can get it at Amazon.com. Amazon.com. Okay. Uh, all right. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Um, I'm sure so many people are going to be able to uh, relate. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Joe. Of course. And uh, this has been your host, be well.